Yes, hello, it's Jason Louv, and this is episode number 37 of the Ultra Culture podcast. And hey, I wanted to start this podcast off by saying how incredibly rare of an individual you are, and how much I truly, truly cherish and appreciate you. Okay, now, maybe that sounds a little sappy, but why is that? Let me back that up and tell you exactly why that is. We talk about some pretty out there topics in this podcast. I mean, we talk about psychedelics, we talk about magic, we talk about spirituality, esoteric Buddhism, we talk about the expansion of consciousness. And let me tell you, these topics, I mean, well, hey, you don't need me to tell you, these topics have been kind of taboo for a long time. They're controversial, they're out there. Some of them in the past, unfortunately, have been somewhat hard to understand. These are also, unfortunately, ideas that people have been a little frightened of in the past. They've been frightened of them because, frankly, people are scared of things that are new. They're sometimes scared of things they don't understand. Uh, And particularly, you know, there's been Hollywood propaganda around things. And, you know, people, you know how people are. But listen, you're clearly not one of those people. You're a person of intellectual curiosity, of courage, somebody who's willing to look past all that. And that shows me that you're somebody who is intellectually curious and who's not willing to settle for the reality that people tell us to settle for. You're a person who wants more for yourself, who wants more for the world. You're somebody who wants to become fully alive and fully awake. And let me tell you, that is a very rare thing. Over the last 20 years, I've traveled around the world to meet with people and talk to people who are interested in the idea of spirituality, interested in the idea of consciousness expansion, interested in the idea of waking up. And it is a rare thing. And it's even rarer for people not just to be interested in it, but to be sincere, to really want to go for it. So when I say that you're an incredibly special and rare and valuable individual, that's why. And I'm not just blowing smoke, okay? I'm not just telling you stuff to flatter you so that you'll listen to my podcast. No, this is an incredibly rare thing. And look, I might not have ever met you in person, but the fact that you're willing to spend this time with me, wherever you are, maybe you're commuting, maybe you're at the gym, maybe you're doing the dishes, wherever you happen to be in the world and whatever you happen to be doing right now, you're taking this time to ponder some of the most important and deep questions of existence. The questions that, frankly, a lot of people in the world, for one reason or the other, spend a lot of time and effort avoiding. And that's not a judgment. That's perfectly okay. But it's just the fact of the matter. Most people just can't be bothered. They'd rather not know. They'd rather not even ask the questions. The questions that you're asking right now. So let me ask you a question. What is reality for you? Are you happy with your reality? Are you really, truly, deeply happy with your reality? If so, that's amazing and I salute you. If not, what do you want your reality to be? What would you prefer? What kind of life do you truly want to be living? What kind of people do you want to be surrounded by? Do you want to be working in a specific way or in a specific job? Is there a role that you want? What future do you truly want to build, not just for yourself, but for the people around you? My guess is, if you're listening to this podcast, you are deeply interested in the idea of changing reality. And that's great. As human beings, I truly believe that we are meant to do that. We are reality-changing beings. And I don't mean that in some fluffy, new age, wishful thinking, positive thinking type way. We're all changing reality every second of every day. We're changing it with the decisions we're making. We're changing it with the decisions we're choosing not to make. That's also a decision. We're changing it by how we're choosing to interact with the people around us. We're changing it by how we're choosing to interact with ourselves. We're changing it by deciding if we're going to be kind to ourselves or cruel to ourselves. If you think of any given day and you think of how many small decisions and actions you take, sometimes big decisions, sometimes big actions, think about how many opportunities you have every day to radically change the direction of your life. 
and think about if all of those days are stacked on top of each other and compound, think of what three years of decisions can do. It can radically change every single thing in your entire life. But how do we do it? It's easy to just talk about that and say, oh, you know, make good decisions or, you know, it's certainly more complicated than that. You know, how do we truly change the reality that we're living into the one that we truly want it to be? There's got to be a method, right? Of course, in the Middle Ages, people used to talk about the idea of alchemy. How do you transform lead into gold? And most people thought that this was about metals. And for some people, it was. They thought it was a literal chemical process. But there's a much deeper, much deeper meaning there. The process of turning lead into gold is taking somebody's life, which is maybe a jumble of confusion and sadness and unhappiness, and turning that into gold, meaning turning that into the gold of purified consciousness, of awakening. That's what alchemy is, and that's what magic is, what it truly is. And I remember so clearly when I first found out about these ideas, I remembered how isolated I felt, how alone I felt, how adrift I felt. I discovered the idea of magic and alchemy when I was in my mid-teens, so 15, 16, 17, definitely around that age. And I remember that feeling so clearly. I remember the feeling of being powerless and helpless and feeling like, the future was just not going to open up for me, you know, feeling like I was just going to end up somewhere that I didn't want to be doing a job that I didn't want to be doing, you know, just going along to get along. And I remember that dawning feeling that we all have as teenagers. Some of us have it earlier. Some of us might have it a little bit later. But that feeling, that realization of understanding that life is not going to be an adventure. It's not going to be like it was promised in the movies. That life is going to be filled with boredom and tedium and compromises and halfway measures and going along to get along and ending up, you know, in a job or in a role that's just good enough and in a relationship that's just good enough. And that sudden moment of understanding that adulthood for most people was a vast field of disappointment and sorrow and buried emotions. And that's what everything around me was telling me. And that's what the ritual of modern life tells us. You know, ritual isn't just some fanciful magical thing. Ritual is what you choose to do every day. And modern life in its own way is a ritual. Everything that we see from day to day reinforces the idea of our powerlessness. All you have to do is turn on the news or look at social media or notice the look of buried disappointment that so many people unfortunately, unfortunately carry with them. So I knew that I needed something more. I knew that I needed to find something that would carry me out of that. There had to be some way I was sure to turn life into what it had to be, into making it into a magical, fulfilling, truly meaningful life, an adventure. And frankly, I also figured in the back of my head, I don't know if this was realistic or not, but I figured in the back of my head that if there was some method out there to do that, it had to be secret because I didn't see hardly anybody who felt, you know, who was doing that. So I figured if there was true, some true method to do that, that it had to be buried, that it had to be hard to find. And I looked, oh boy, I looked, I spent years scouring all of the books on, on development and esoteric philosophy and magic that I could find. And it was hard to do that back then. You know, I had to go to university special collections. You know, this was before everything was available on the internet. And I had to try so hard to find other people who had begun on this path. But let me tell you, that feeling of excitement that I started to get as I started to read about things like magic and meditation and spirituality and alchemy and all of these incredible techniques and tools, that feeling of excitement started to build in me like, well, like a little uh, ray of gold beginning to build, you know, just like the first processes of alchemy. But it certainly wasn't easy. Alchemy is a process. There are stages. There's hard stages. 
there was the rush of initial excitement when you find out about these tools, magic, enlightenment, spirituality, all this stuff. It is freaking exciting to have that sense of empowerment, that sense that you know something that you dug and you tried and you succeeded and you found this tool, this incredible thing that most people don't even know exists. That, as I'm sure you know, is an incredible feeling. But that's just the beginning. Once you start actually applying it, you start to realize that, wow, this is a life path. This is a, you know, this is a lot of work. And it's just like training in anything else. It's like a training in a martial art. And you have to, tr- or training to learn a musical instrument or master computer programming or whatever it happens to be. It takes daily effort. And part of that effort is seeing all the parts of yourself that you don't want to see. Part of that effort, I mean, it's really the true effort is, you know, as they call it, the negredo stage in alchemy, the, the dark stage, the stage of seeing all of your unawakened and unconscious parts and all the things and behaviors that you've been doing throughout your lifetime that have covered up the light. And, and the light is, of course, our inherent nature. But we get caught up in all these games, we, you know, as time goes on, we get caught up in all these games and behaviors and thoughts and idea structures and you know media brainwashing there's so many things that are thrown at us that cover up that light and facing the fact that we've done that to ourselves that is hard and it's hard work to un- to to take out the trash you know so much of spirituality is taking out our own trash you know it's it still is 20 years later but then of course as time goes on, you build competence and confidence and you start to feel the excitement of getting closer and closer to the life that you truly want to live for yourself. And there's no end, by the way. Some of these books on magic, like Crowley talks about discovering your true will and things like that. There's no final stage. There's no final enlightenment as as far as I can tell. What there is, is an ongoing process, a way of living your life a way of living your life in which you're more alive, more awake, more compassionate, and best of all, in a way, more in line with what you feel you truly should be doing with your life. So one of the things I've chosen to do with my life, it's not the only thing, but it's definitely one of them, is to make this technology more accessible to people because it was so hard for me to dig and find this and not just find it, but find the functional core past all the smoke screens and obfuscation and all the propaganda. And I want people to get access to it. Now, that doesn't mean that I want to make it easy or dumb it down or water it down in some way. But what it does mean is that I want to make it easier for people to at least get on the path. The path is tricky. It's hard. It's, it's, it truly takes a lifetime. You know, it's hard work in a lot of the ways that I've already described. But it's hard enough work to just do the practice. Most of the information that we've inherited about magic and alchemy and spirituality and enlightenment and all this, uh, a lot of it has been written in code. A lot of it is written with exaggerated metaphors that are not particularly helpful uh, for several reasons. One is that a lot of it is old writing. Another one is that a lot of it was encoded because, you know, people were hiding from a dominant culture that was afraid of these ideas and wanted to stamp them out. And, and you know, if you go back a few hundred years, people could lose their lives for being interested in some of these ideas. So unfortunately, that's left a bit of work to do in terms of resurrecting the tradition and making it clear and turning the lights on. So that's left us with a little bit of work in terms of resurrecting the tradition, making the terms clear, laying it out so that people can understand it. And honestly, I kind of see myself as like a gym, you know, like I'm running a gym. You know, most of my work has been to turn on the lights at the gym and dust off the equipment and oil the equipment and make sure all the equipment actually works. Now, it's the job of people who are students who are interested in pursuing these techniques to actually work out at the gym. But that's enough work. You know, it's enough work to, you know, to get physically fit and healthy at a gym without having to, you know, run the maintenance of the gym while you're and and, and, you know, try to figure out how exercise actually works while you're there. So over the last few years, I've made, frankly, really good headway in resurrecting the tradition. Now, there's still a lot more to do, but I've put some things into place that are going to be very, very helpful for people. One of those is, of course, Magic.me, my school for magic, where all of the techniques are laid out and clearly presented and on offer. Uh, That's there. 
And the other is my book that just came out, John D. and the Empire of Angels, which is, if you haven't seen it yet, it's a freaking massive book. It's almost 600 pages. And it is a huge compendium of the history of the Western magical tradition and what it actually is and where it actually came from and what its goals actually are. That's because what I did with this book is reassemble the entire story of the last 500 years of the development of the Western magical tradition. And that's not an easy task because so much of the history that we have of this is broken and fragmentary, just like I've mentioned. But what I've done here is find the core of the tradition, which I I do believe is Enochian, Enochian magic, and drawn that thread out of history. I focused on Dr. John Dee, who of course is in the title of the book, who is the, you know, the originator in a way with Edward Kelly of what we now know as Western magic. And I trace that forward in history, not just through Dee and Kelly, but through every single magical revival and movement that has come since. I mean, the Rosicrucians, the Freemasons, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, Aleister Crowley's Thelema, even up to the modern day with things like witchcraft and modern countercultural movements, all of which I believe truly trace their DNA to John Dee. Now, if you don't know who he was, I'll get into John Dee in a second, but I want to underline that what this really means, why this is truly important, is that what I've really done here is show exactly what magic really is in the context of Western culture, what it truly is in a historical sense, and how much it's impacted the history of not only the world, but everything around us, how it's in a way shaped the reality that we're living in. And what that really means is that. This is the true source book of magic. It's, in my opinion, the best book currently on the market that shows exactly what magic truly is and turns the lights on and reveals the living tradition, not the propaganda, not the silly embellishments that people have put on it who haven't truly understood what this is. And, you know, we currently live in a moment in which these ideas are so much more popular, you know, whether it's magic or witchcraft or you know, some type of psychedelic spirituality, esotericism, things like that. These ideas have become part of the cultural currency. And that's great in a lot of ways, because it's exciting to me to see more and more people get interested in this. But there's also some pitfalls. And one of those is that since people haven't really fully understood the territory, they haven't really understood what they're dealing with. They've created halfway versions or fanciful versions or in many cases patched over the holes of historical and academic understanding with the the force of their own personalities and unfortunately that's left us with a playing field that is not very clear and which also frankly you know people who are just getting interested in this stuff they're being presented with things that could be rabbit holes that kind of go nowhere, you know, tunnels to nowhere. So that's not what I wanted. I wanted the true historical context of what magic actually is and how it has actually shaped Western history, the true tradition. I wanted to bring the true tradition forward, not a distortion. So let me make an analogy to make this really clear and demonstrate why it was so important for me to write this book. So let's take karate. Right. Let's imagine that karate was invented 500 years ago uh, and people were practicing it and getting really, really good at it and becoming masters of it. And it was a it was a living tradition that was passed down from teacher to student hand to hand. But let's imagine also that these schools were secret. They were secret because people didn't want that information getting out into the wrong hands where it could be misused. I mean, karate, you know, somebody who knows martial arts and is really good at martial arts is very dangerous, particularly in a context where people don't have, uh, you know, modern weaponry. So let's imagine that that was the case. There were these secret schools of karate and that the people who were practicing karate were writing down all the instructions for how to do karate in code and in secret metaphors so that if people found the instructions, they wouldn't be able to just teach themselves karate from the texts. Now, let's say that over time, you know, as the decades went on and then the centuries, two things began to happen. One 
is that word started to get out. People started to find out about karate. Now, they didn't, they didn't know how to do it, but maybe they saw people using karate and they heard rumors, wild rumors of these powerful karate masters who could do anything and defeat 10 men and fight tigers in combat. And you know how rumors spread. They get more and more embellished. So let's say people were talking about karate. And of course, you know, they were, you know, writing about karate and, and they started to tell tales about karate of what they thought it might be, even if they were sincere. In many cases, maybe people might have been attacking it or exaggerating it, embellishing it. But let's say even people who were sincere but didn't have access to what the true tradition started to make their best guess of what karate had to be. And, and they started to write down what they thought karate was. And also, perhaps even they started to teach what they thought karate was and kind of created their own halfway imagined version. Now, let's say that while that's happening, at the same time, the true karate schools start to pull back because they see it, you know, getting out into the public. They see it becoming more of a fad and they decide this is getting out of hand. Uh, it's making it it's making it hard for us to practice. It's it's creating you know, kind of a crazy environment. Let's, uh, let's close the doors and be a little bit more private about this stuff. And maybe for that reason or other reasons, as time went on, there started to be less living karate masters. They started teaching fewer people. And then as time went on, people started to die. And, you know, as we see, as, as time goes on, sometimes things can die out. Even in our modern world, there are many traditions that are currently dying out. You know, wh- another example is metallurgy, metalworking, um, you know, origami, any type of craft that is rooted in the past and is not, you know, on a computer, not digital. A lot of these crafts and trades are dying out in our modern world. So let's imagine that's what happened. Uh, as time went on, there were really no living karate masters left or just a few here and there. And at the same time, there was all this stuff being written about what people thought karate was and, and maybe even, you know, halfway schools or schools that are you know, not teaching anything real. And so we end up fast forwarding 300 years and there's nothing but fake karate everywhere. So that's basically what happened with Western magic. The true tradition as time went on was more and more buried, more and more covered up, more and more hidden, more and more misunderstood, more and more fell victim to propaganda attacks by the church and and other, other groups. And at the exact same time, over the last few hundred years or more, people have been peddling all these fanciful versions of it or halfway realized versions of it. And it's not like there's any body that checks that. You know, in the sciences, there's peer review. People have to check people's findings. That doesn't exist in magic and it doesn't exist in spirituality. People can just say whatever they like. And the only criteria for judgment, unfortunately now, you know, and and, uh, this is not accurate criteria for judgment, is whether people are interested, if it makes people feel good, if it sells books, all this. Uh, those are not actual valid criteria for judging if something is is real or not. So what that means is for modern students of the occult, there is a lot of dross to sort through. There's the dross of people's halfway realized accounts. There's the dross of propaganda attacks, cultural stereotypes and prejudice, and then people simply making false claims about magic uh, that are just not true. So how does this help us? It, it just doesn't. It creates a confusing playing field. How does this help us get this technology to transform the lead of our lives into gold, to take us from the reality that we're in and may be unsatisfied with into the reality that we want? How does it help us to wake up? It doesn't. It's just a bunch of clutter. And I'm just not satisfied with that. I'm not satisfied with it because people need this now. They're going through it now. They're suffering now. And they need the tool to get to where they want to go. It's that simple. If I want to wake up and become more enlightened and more actualized and more realized, it's not going to help me to deal with thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of pages of poorly written books and and nonsense on the internet. I don't want to sort through those giant landfills of nonsense to get to just the tool that I need now to actualize my life. I want to be going towards my dreams with tools that work, not, you know, treading water in this landfill of crap. 
So that's why this book had to exist. It's why magic.me had to exist. I need to give people the tools and then I need to show them the context of what these tools actually are and where they came from so that they can get to where they're going because this stuff is real and it works. In fact, it works while everything else in the world is collapsing. All you have to do is turn on the news to see how everything is falling apart and in a state of confusion. And yet, ironically, hilariously, magic, the thing that everyone, you know, discarded and and thought was silly and not relevant to modern life, that's the one thing that's left. That's the one thing that works, that actually delivers. It's like that most, uh, you know, meaningful and portentous phrase from the Bible that's been used so much in the Western esoteric tradition and alchemy. I am the stone that the builders rejected. That's magic, right? It's spirituality, it's enlightenment, it's consciousness, it's what's in you already. That's the thing that the stone that the builders rejected becomes the capstone of the entire thing, right? That's what's happening right now. While the world falls apart into chaos and madness and dispersion and disintegration, it's those who are willing to bring forth what is already in them, the light that is already in them. Those are the ones who will thrive and succeed and triumph. So, What is reality becoming for you? Where are you going? Where are you going to take this? Are you willing and daring enough to truly become who you know you are meant to be? To say, forget settling. To say, forget half measures. To say, forget disappointment. But instead, to go for it. To actualize. To awaken. I think we both know the answer to that question. And that's why you're so special and precious, and rare. And that's why I've done everything that I can and will continue to do everything that I can to turn on the lights and lay the tools out for you. But all I can do is open the doors for you. That's it. You've got to walk through the doors. You've got to get on the path, and you have to walk it. See, for me, the future is an exciting place. It's a place of love and compassion and human growth and an incredible destiny that we build for ourselves as a species. It's not a place of zombie apocalypse and everything breaking and everything falling apart and everything's going to be terrible. There's enough. We hear enough of that, and I don't buy it. I don't believe it. We're too smart for that. I see a future of awakened and realized people leading us to the stars. That's the future that I see, and that's the future that we're building, and that's the future our ancestors have been building. That's the future that so many people who have come before in the Western magical tradition and in other spiritual traditions have been building for the world. So in my way of thinking, in order to fully understand where we're going, we also need to understand where we've been. And that's why I've written this book. John Dee, one of the primary progenitors of the Western magical tradition, was an enlightened scientist and spiritual adventurer, somebody who saw humanity as it could be, Somebody who undertook the great work of transforming not just himself, but the entire planet from lead to gold, who wanted to absolutely actualize the entire human species. This isn't a pipe dream. It's real. It's what we're engaged in right now. So as you've probably guessed by now, I don't have a guest for this episode of the podcast, but my guest in a way is Dr. John D. himself. And if you don't know who he was, that's all about to change. I'm about to lay it all out. So for this episode of the podcast only, what I'm going to do is give you a special treat and do a reading of the opening of John Dee and the Empire of Angels, Enochian Magic and the Occult Roots of the Modern World, which is my new book. It's out from Inner Traditions. You can get it anywhere books are sold. You can get it from Amazon. You can get it from the special website I built for it, which is johnd007.com. And all the links are there. You can get it in hardback or ebook. And there's no audio book so far. This is the first performance of it, at least a little bit of it. But if there's enough interest, maybe from this podcast, uh, maybe I'll talk the publisher into letting me do an uh, an audiobook version. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read the preface and a sizable excerpt from the introduction. And we're going to get into some serious, serious territory here. And you're going to get a sense of how enthralling and just absolutely crucial this material is and why I would do something like, you know, take three years out of my life to write a book about it. Now, this is only going to be just a little sliver of the whole book, you know, just a little taste, but the whole thing will be waiting for you at amazon.com 
or Barnes & Noble, or at the website that I've set up for the book at johnd007.com. So, with no further ado, please welcome John D. and the Empire of Angels. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Genesis 3.22-24 The great secret known to Apollonius of Tyana, Paul of Tarsus, Simon Magus, Asclepius, Paracelsus, Burma, and Bruno is that we are moving backward in time. The universe, in fact, is contracting into a unitary entity which is completing itself. Decay and disorder are seen by us in reverse, as increasing. These healers learn to move forward in time, which is retrograde to us. Philip K. Dick, Vallis. Preface, In the Garden Beginning it all, a man, a woman, and a dragon. Around them, the Garden of Eden. A single, shining instance, before time began, with all its stupidity of suffering, loss, and waste, in which there is only the devotion of God for his creation, and man and woman together, in love. Blissfully unaware, Adam and Eve sleep sheltered in each other's arms beneath the tree of life. They speak with the language of angels, and with it Adam begins to name the things around him. Imagine yourself as Adam, naming all that you see, watching as each facet of eternity comes into being as a separate object, divided from the supernal totality that is the body of God. And then into this perfection comes the dragon, the snake of fear. Eat of the tree of knowledge, says the dragon, and you shall taste all that God has hidden from you. Look into its eyes, see it twisting and coruscating in 333 colors. The afterbirth of God's creation the crack in the plan. How must evil itself have appeared to such pure and innocent beings, the original parents of humanity, before the fall? See it dancing, a serpent of light. Listen to the wind howling through the rainforest as the dragon coils up toward the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, urging you to take it. Look, the apple is perfectly polished. At first you can see your face in its surface, but now your focus begins to blur. You look through it, scrying. Observe now the end of time. See the red dragon as it shall be, the deceiver not just of the first humans but of the last, with seven crowned heads and ten horns, rearing up to conquer heaven itself. See its servants, a seven-headed beast upon which a scarlet horror rides, causing all humanity to worship the dragon as the nations decay and the human project collapses. The final degradation in which the four cardinal directions are opened by death Famine, war, conquest. See the last judgment, the Son of God come to reign for a millennium, when all but the saved are cast down to eternal torment in the lake of fire, and all of this to redeem what you are about to do. Now eat it, the dragon says. Don't you want to know what it is to be a god? Introduction A Sublunary World Between 1582 and 1589, Two men, Dr. John Dee, a mathematician and scientific advisor to Elizabeth I, and Edward Kelly, an itinerant psychic, claimed that they held regular conversations with angels. These angels explained the true origins of humanity and delivered the original language spoken by mankind before the fall. This language, along with a mathematically complex system for making further contact with the angels, was to be used by Dee and Kelly to advance the world toward the apocalypse. This was not a marginal event. Indeed, it has been central to the last 500 years of Western civilization. Through Dee, who invented the phrase British Empire, and worked to manifest a new Christian religion uniting all humanity in preparation for the Second Coming, we can find the genesis of not only the British but the American Empire, and in the utterances of the angels we can find the spiritual blueprint that has driven them both. This tremendous, albeit occulted, impact on history did not end with Dee. The influence of Dee and the angelic system he and Kelly deliver to the world can be found in an astonishing number of the major turning points of Western history since Dee's death. 
in the birth of modern science, in the creation of the secret societies that liberalized Europe and gave America its spiritual calling, in the creation of the state of Israel and its subsequent centrality to American foreign policy, and even in the genesis of the United States space program. In studying Dee and his work, we are studying the secret history of the world. This, then, is the story of John Dee, a doctor of the sublunary world, who sought to reverse the fall of mankind and return all of nature to God, to create a new Eden by prompting the apocalypse. Moreover, it is the story of his angelic system, the men and movements it influenced, such as Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, the Royal Society, the Golden Dawn, Aleister Crowley, and Jacques Parsons, and how it not only changed the world, but in many ways created the world we now inhabit. Indeed, just as the work of St. Paul is responsible for turning the ideas of a Jewish messianic sect into a holy Roman empire, so is the work of Dr. D responsible for turning those of the Protestant dissenters into a global empire of angels. Born into a humble family with minor court connections in 1527, John D quickly distinguished himself as a brilliant student and soon rose to the heights of European intellectual life, becoming one of the great scientific minds of Europe during the time of Copernicus, Bruno, and Tycho Brahe, and a great popularizer and teacher of mathematics. Yet Dee sought not to master one subject, but the totality of the sciences then available. This, for Dee, was a spiritual quest to know the mind of God, and like many of the intellectuals of his day, he extended his studies into occult philosophy, seeking direct contact with higher spiritual beings that he hoped would continue his education. Reviewing his case in 1967, the National Security Agency summed up Armand D. as a principal advisor to most of the Tudor monarchs of England and to certain European rulers as well, including the Emperor Rudolf II. As government consultant, he excelled in mathematics, cryptography, natural science, navigation, and library science, and above all, in the really rewarding sciences of those days, astrology, alchemy, and psychic phenomena. He was, all by himself, a Rand Corporation for the Tudor government of Elizabeth. Because of Dee's vast range of interests, he has remained opaque to popular history. His occult activities have long been considered an embarrassment, and have been used as a cautionary tale of how even great geniuses can fall victim to their own wishful thinking. Many biographers and commentators on Dee, likely wary of undermining their own careers, bracket their writing on his angelic conversations with disdain, downplaying the importance of Dee's occult interest to his overall work. This means that most of the assessment of Dee's occult work has been done by occult writers, where his system of communication with angels, often dubbed Enochian magic, a phrase not used by Dee, is discussed on its own merits, divorced from the overall context of Dee's life and work. Writers who downplay Dee's occult activities make the error of assessing him from a sterilized modern viewpoint, instead of summoning the bravery to interact with Dee on his own terms. Those who focus solely on Dee's occultism make the converse error, extracting his angelic conversations from his other work, depriving them of critical context, over-romanticizing them, or conflating them with later New Age or theosophical ideas. Both of these compartmentalizations of Dee's legacy do him a disservice. This book will instead strive to achieve a balanced unity. In the process, I hope to demonstrate the centrality of the occult to the history of Western civilization and shed further light on the true nature of both. Dee's belief in the existence of a spiritual realm inhabited by both good and evil beings, interpenetrating both daily life and history, was standard in the Elizabethan period. However, those who engaged with this spirit world outside of the official bounds of the Anglican or Roman churches, whether hermetic magicians among the academic elite, street-level cunning men and scryers, or, indeed, non-Anglican Protestants, were often criminalized, imprisoned, or killed for their troubles. D is remarkable not for his occult interests, but for the unprecedented level of intellectual and scientific rigor he brought to them, for the fact that a man of his social position took such remarkable personal and professional risks in pursuing them, and for the phenomenal corpus of records he left behind. In our own time, the doors to the intoxicating and hallucinatory world of magic and alchemy have long since been closed by science, and the experimental techniques once used by men like Dee, Bruno, and Newton to investigate the subtleties of the human spirit have been left to wither in the twilight of the New Age. This makes the active exploration of the invisible world as unacceptable today as it was in Dee's time, with the main advance being that those who breach such taboo territory are economically and socially marginalized rather than imprisoned or killed. Yet stories like Dee's are not without precedent in the modern world, especially among mathematicians like Dee, some of whom have recorded similar experiences. 
John Nash, for instance, the Nobel Prize winning American mathematician and economist who did critical work on game theory in the 1940s and 50s and gave us the Nash equilibrium, believed that he had been recruited by aliens to save the world, that they were assisting him by sending him mathematical equations, and that they later acted to end his career. When asked how he could believe in such an outlandish scenario, Nash replied, because the ideas I had about supernatural beings came to me the same way that my mathematical ideas did, so I took them seriously. The brilliant, self-taught Indian mathematician Srinivasa Ramanujan attributed his early 20th century achievements in higher mathematics to his family deity, the goddess Mahalakshmi, and received visions of scrolls of mathematical equations opening before his eyes. He is quoted as saying, An equation has no meaning to me unless it expresses a thought of God. The quote could have come from D himself. Carl Sagan's 1985 novel Contact also assesses the idea of higher intelligences contacting humanity through the language of advanced math. The science fiction writer Philip K. Dick, who famously recorded his contact experience with an intelligence he called Vallis in his final novels, also spoke of language, the Logos, as a living entity and medium of transmission from a higher dimension. The reality-puncturing ferocity of the Gnostic Christ of Dick's exegesis and the apocalyptic vitriol of the angels of Dean Kelly's spirit diaries are not far away in tone and content. Nash was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, institutionalized, and experienced severe career issues as a result. Philip K. Dick also contextualized his experience as traumatic, profoundly alienating him from those around him. Ramanujan, on the other hand, experienced no such friction. While the seriousness of particularly Nash's illness should not be downplayed or trivialized, it is also worth noting that Ramanujan differed from Nash in that his claim of visions was considered acceptable within the general cultural narrative of Hinduism, in which reports of divine inspiration or contact are routine. This reading of Nash, Dick, Ramanujan, and even Dee and Kelly's differing experiences is supported by an interview-based study conducted by Stanford anthropologist Tanya Lerman in 2014, that suggested that the voices heard by individuals with serious psychotic disorder are shaped by culture. Lerman found that Americans reported violent, warlike, demonic, and overwhelmingly negative voices occasionally punctuated by the voice of God, which were perceived as traumatic and pathological. Individuals from India and Africa, on the other hand, reported experiencing voices as helpful spirits or family relationships and felt them to be generally positive and to conform with cultural expectations about reality. Lerman's description of the voices heard by Americans closely fits the angelic apparitions reported by Dee's unstable English scryer Edward Kelly and perhaps can tell us something about the cultural context of Protestant Christianity. However, like Ramanujan and unlike modern Westerners, Dee and Kelly existed in a cultural context that supported the validity of their experiences. While not generally well regarded, magic, scrying, and angel contact were nevertheless widespread in Elizabethan England. These contact experiences, whatever their provenance, are not confined to the margins of society. They are, in fact, woven into the very fabric of world culture. Many mainstream religions incorporate, or are even founded on, claims of contact with angels that are far less documented than these, with notable examples being the revelation of John and the prophet Muhammad's reception of the Quran from the archangel Gabriel, a being that also appears in these spirit diaries. The Kabbalistic practices of Judaism, the parent tradition of Christianity and Islam, form a tightly knit system of mathematical interpretation of scripture and even, according to some readings, two-way communication with angels, making mathematical contact with spiritual entities an established, if closely guarded, religious tradition. That these claims of supernatural contact exist purely in the realm of subjectivity and faith has not, of course, impeded their ability to shape world cultures. Since these angelic revelations are at the root of the three primary monotheist religions in the world, as of 2010 they made up the lived mythology of 2.17 billion Christians, 1.6 billion Muslims, and 13.9 million Jews. This means that over half of the world's population, 54.8%, draw their model of the world from what they believe to be messages from angels. Due in part to the rapid growth of Islam, that figure will rise to 61.1% of the world's 9.3 billion population in 2050. Of course, the big three are not the only religions that claim to rest on direct revelation, only the largest ones that claim descent from angels as a specific class of mythological being. Such communication between individuals and higher intelligences via math, Kabbalism, and secret languages is also a running trope in the occult subculture, notably within groups that draw their inspiration from D. 
the occult occupies a treacherous liminal zone between the competing discourses of science and religion, both of which reject it. It is tiny, decentralized, largely overlooked by modern culture, unpoliced by the processes of licensing or peer review, and concerned with entirely subjective aspects of the human experience, making it a no-man's land where scientists, if not angels, fear to tread. Partly because he explored this perilous territory between objective science and subjective magic, Dee's name was occluded from history by the religious and scientific reformers that followed him. However, Dee's magic has as little to do with modern notions of the occult as it does with modern notions of science. Rather than grimoire sorcery or woolly New Age mysticism, Dee and Kelly's scrying sessions were an outgrowth of Christian piety and the scriptural tradition of received wisdom granted to worthy individuals by angelic beings. Likewise, the proto-science of Dee's time was fundamentally different from what we think of as science today. While modern science is forward-looking, seeking to continually test and refine what we know about the universe through experiment, the proto-science that existed before the scientific revolution was backward-looking. Europe was still crawling out of the Dark Ages and deeply concerned with recovering the knowledge it had lost. After the sack of Constantinople by the Ottoman Turks in 1453, Orthodox priests had fled to the Italian city-states, bringing with them Greek and Latin manuscripts that Western Europe had lacked access to, which scholars quickly seized upon. This meant that the prevailing intellectual climate during Dee's life was humanism, the study of the classics. Western Europe had lost so much during the long night between the fall of Rome and the Renaissance that its scholars and early scientists saw their task as the recovery of the lost knowledge of antiquity, Greek and Roman philosophy, and the Bible itself. While the narrative of progress now leads us to think of humanity's knowledge increasing as history advances, Renaissance thinkers believed that knowledge was naturally degrading over time and had to be recovered and preserved. The ultimate source of knowledge was not in the future, but in following the trail of history back through the ancient world, even toward rediscovering what humanity had known before the fall of the Tower of Babel and the fall from Eden itself. The true source of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding was God and God had progressively distanced himself from human affairs. Therefore, the enterprising scientist or magician was tasked with chasing him backward through time. This quest to restore mankind's knowledge, and even its original pre-fall spiritual condition, was the primary goal of many of Europe's intellectual elite during Dee's time, and Dee's work is the high watermark. To make sense of Dee's work, we must not only make the difficult leap of taking on the Renaissance worldview, but also juggle two narratives and intersecting levels of reality. One is the story of England's growth, its split from the Catholic Church, and its subsequent transition into a global empire. The second is the spiritual narrative of Christianity itself, beginning with the fall and ending with the apocalypse and second coming of Christ. Modern readers should easily be able to compartmentalize these stories as facets of European history. This was not at all the case for Dee or his contemporaries, for whom these mythic narratives were indistinguishable, forming the fabric of Elizabethan reality. Just as Dee sought to restore the fallen world by divine aid, this book attempts to restore and reconstitute Dee's life, work, and ongoing historical impact as a coherent narrative, and to tell the story of one of the most improbable and quietly influential figures in European history, who stood at the crossroads of the Renaissance and Enlightenment, and, perhaps with the aid of the host of heaven, delivered the blueprint for humanity's final days. England at the Dawn of Empire before we assess John Dee, let us begin by describing the chaotic and fractured world into which he was born, and that he would seek to repair. For if the angels did indeed speak to Dee, they chose the most dramatic time possible to reinsert themselves into the story of Christendom. The 16th century marked the most critical transition point in Western civilization since Constantine's conversion of Rome to Christianity 12 centuries prior, when the Edict of Milan had in one stroke turned Christianity into a major world religion. This rejection of paganism and acceptance of the new populist faith phase changed the power of the Roman Empire from a terrestrial to a spiritual imperium. While Rome itself would crumble, the Catholic Church would continue to dominate the European Dark and Middle Ages as the primary source of spiritual authority and cultural cohesion. Yet by Dee's time, the Church's monopoly on European thought was ending, just as dramatically as it had begun. The Middle Ages were coming to a close, marked by the invention of the printing press around 1440 by the fall of Constantinople to Islam in 1453, and by Martin Luther's initiation of the Protestant Reformation in 1517. In England, in 1534, Henry VIII would ground Luther's spiritual ideals into the political sphere by overthrowing the church's hold on his country. 
Infuriated with his Spanish Catholic wife, Catherine of Aragon's inability to give him a son, inflamed with lust for the young Protestant Anne Boleyn, and incensed with Cardinal Thomas Wolsey's refusal to grant him a divorce from Catherine, Henry had taken up Anne's new evangelical ideas, had Wolsey executed, and had declared himself the supreme head of the new Protestant Church of England. Henry's government had then privatized and sacked the Catholic monasteries in England, claiming the substantial spoils and then redistributing the land creating a new English middle class in the process. The product of Henry's marriage to Anne Boleyn would be Elizabeth, a child prodigy who would grow into perhaps the greatest monarch in English history, and who, with the help of John Dee, would initiate the transformation of England from a tiny island nation into the empire on which the sun never sets, so named because it held so much territory that the sun was always shining somewhere in its domain. Henry's marriage would also set the stage for centuries of sectarian violence, from the Holocaust of Protestants that was to come, with the short reign of Henry's elder daughter, Mary, to the Troubles, the brutal 20th century paramilitary wars between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland. Man's place in the universe and sense of himself were being shaken to the core. Luther's revolution left his followers to fend for themselves spiritually instead of relying on the church's central authority. The invention of the printing press had helped lay the groundwork for the Reformation by making the Bible available to more than just church specialists. This worked to undermine the church by demonstrating that its sacraments had no basis in the teachings of Christ, let alone its practices of tithing and indulgences, or the grotesque amassing of wealth by its leaders. The resulting doctrinal war broke the church and the European political landscape apart. Luther's, and subsequently John Calvin's, insurrection was an attack not just on a singular religion, but because the Catholic Church had universal power over both the political and spiritual functions of Europe, an attack on reality itself. The seismic shock of Luther's 95 Theses is likely impossible for modern readers to appreciate or even conceptualize. In the 21st century, Christianity has greatly lost its hold on the world's imagination, relegated to just another option in the supermarket of potential beliefs. In 16th century Europe, it was reality. The Reformation came not as a total surprise, however, but as a sudden crystallization of innumerable stresses on the Roman Church and of slowly emerging public dissent. Institutional corruption in the Church, the incursions of Islam, the birth of the middle class, growing wealth inequality, rising nationalism, secularization, and skepticism, and the prior revolts of the Waldensians, John Wycliffe, and Jan Hus had all put cracks in the church's dam. All these began the work that Luther would complete, so that when he hammered in his 95 theses, the dam burst and let loose a flood of public dissent that had been held back for over a millennium. When that dam broke, so did the world as it had been known and understood for all those long centuries. In addition to this rupture of faith, two events were permanently invalidating the medieval worldview. The discovery of the new world and the Copernican revelation that the sun, not the earth, sat at the center of the solar system. Soon, the opening of the Western Hemisphere would lead to a new Cold War between Catholic and Protestant powers, not only for territory, but for converts. Simultaneously, from the ashes of the preceding millennium of superstition, magical thinking, and religious fear, the phoenix of science was undergoing its birth pangs. Rather than a singular church, there were now many. Rather than one world, there were now two. Rather than the inherited knowledge of the Gospels and the ancients, Science would soon come to show that nearly everything Western man assumed to be true was likely not. And rather than existing at the center of the cosmos, mankind was now relegated to orbiting the sun. If it seemed like the end of the world, that's because it was. The final and definitive death of the Middle Ages, and the beginning of the modern world to come. For many, this could only be evidence of the second coming, the book of Revelation playing out on the world stage. For Protestants, their struggle was against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. It was a struggle against the Pope, whom Luther identified with Antichrist, and with Rome itself, which Luther named the Whore of Babylon from the Book of Revelation, and which the Presbyterian firebrand John Knox called a synagogue of Satan. I rejoice, Martin Luther wrote as the Reformation took root, that God raises up men who will give the last blow to popery, and finish the war against Antichrist, which I began. Thus were the terrestrial authorities of the church cast not as stewards of Christ's light, but as pawns of the dragon, a dragon that had been responsible not only for a millennium of imperial control, but that, in the here and now, the new English Protestants lived in mortal fear of, a dragon that, in the form of Bloody Mary, 
had regularly burned Protestants at the stake in group executions, filling the air with a stench of human fat. It is no wonder the apocalyptic woodcuts of Albrecht Dürer so captured the English public imagination. His prints, depicting biblical scenes from the fall to St. Michael and his angels fighting back the red dragon in the heavens above England, were in high demand in households throughout the country. What we now see as a Reformation was then seen as the Millennium, and Europe became saturated with heralds of the end times. Like the Spanish theologian Michael Servetus, who, presaging D, announced that Michael himself would unleash a holy war upon the Antichrists who ruled Rome and Geneva. He was denounced by John Calvin and quickly burned at the stake. Yet though the new Protestants defined themselves in opposition to the evils of Rome, they brought their own horrors with them, blind hatred of the church, its art and ritual, a rejection of humanism, an obsession with Satan and his seemingly omnipresent demons, a return to an Old Testament view of a punishing and spiteful God, and an unflinching and almost Gnostic emphasis on personal salvation from the jaws of hell eternal, even in the case of Calvin, predestination, which must rank among the cruelest religious concepts ever forced upon mankind. All of these made for a very humorless and terrifying new religious environment. In their counter-excesses of dogmatic literalism, the new Protestants presaged the evangelical fundamentalists of the modern world. Though the Roman Church might have been corrupt, its more forgiving view of human nature had made for the relaxed, business-as-usual attitude that Luther had railed against, but that most of Europe had long been accommodated to, and under which humanism had made great strides, at least within the milieu of the educated upper classes. The punishing black-and-white view of Luther and Calvin made no such concessions. Yet though their revolution would seem to institute a new and unflinching absolutism, it would ultimately prove a democratizing force. Calvinism encouraged brave and ruthless men to win a continent and spread the base of education and self-government until all men could be free, wrote historian Will Durant. Men who chose their own pastors soon claimed to choose their governors, and the self-ruled congregation became the self-governed municipality. The myth of divine election justified itself in the making of America. Following Luther's original split with Rome, Christendom would continue to subdivide, producing not only Calvinists, but Baptists, Anabaptists, Mennonites, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and many more sects and denominations to come. In many cases, what are now established religious branches were then millennial cults. In England, however, the crown was doing its utmost to keep reality ordered and tidy. Though the first act of supremacy in 1534 established the Ecclesia Anglicana and officially threw England's lot in with the Reformers, it was only by way of a shift in the locus of control, not doctrine. The only difference between the Church of England and the Church of Rome was that Henry VIII sat at the new church's head, not the Pope. In all other outward forms, it was still the Catholic Church. All breaks from Catholic doctrine were still considered heresy by the Church of England and persecuted mercilessly, as was anybody unwise enough to question the king's absolute authority over church and state, meaning that both Protestant and Catholic dissenters were put under Henry's boot. Awash in his lust for more power, wealth, and a male heir, Henry had simply cut through the firmament of European faith to satisfy his own appetite. Yet it is from this act of ecclesiastical violence and its subsequent pogroms that we inherit the age of Shakespeare, the British Empire, the foundation of the United States, and much of the current world order. Furthermore, this split began the disintegration of the church's historical lock on knowledge, allowing the scientific revolution to occur. Though Luther was quick to hang the label of Antichrist upon the Pope and of Whore of Babylon upon Rome, perhaps a parallel narrative was at work. In their dual action to break the central authority of the church, it would be tempting to see the carnal and amoral Henry VIII as a reflection of the great beast, and Elizabeth, exoterically the virgin queen, esoterically reflecting the scarlet-haired mystery Babylon, with Dee's work initiating the process of apocalypse itself, both terrestrially and celestially. All of this, of course, would form the fertile backdrop of the angelic conversations to come, and when Dee's angels arrived, they would not be without their opinions or their vitriol and what had occurred in their absence from the affairs of men. Okay, and with that, we conclude the 
opening introductory reading from John Dee and the Empire of Angels, and there is so much more to come. There's the life of John Dee and his, his fascinating intellectual quest to understand the mind of God. We're talking about the smartest man of the 16th century. There's the bloody political battle between Elizabeth and Mary and the Protestant and Catholic sides in, in England and how they almost tore the British Isles apart. There's Dee's opening of the new world and his sending of secret naval missions, naval black ops to the Americas to try and claim them for England. There's the battle with Spain and the sinking of the Spanish Armada in one of the most resounding military defeats in, in world history. And that's just the beginning. Then we get into Dee's fascinating scrying sessions with Edward Kelly where they claim to speak with the entire host of heaven and and find a language and system for contacting angels. And then the angels telling them to use it to bring about the end of the world. And then we trace the story all the way up to the modern day, looking at Freemasonry, Rosicrucianism, looking at how Dee's ideas took hold in, in Europe and changed the course of history, how they laid the, the foundation for science. And then we take it all the way up to the Golden Dawn, to Aleister Crowley and Crowley's work with Dee's magical system in Algeria. And then, of course, I had to look at Jack Parsons, who's responsible for creating NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratories while he was experimenting with Dee's magic, and all the way up to the modern day, right now, and how these ideas have completely shaped everything around us, how they're responsible for science, how they're responsible for America, how they're responsible for space travel. This is the wildest ride you are ever going to take in the form of an occult book. I promise you that. And of course, don't take my word for it. Here's what some absolute intellectual and cultural luminaries had to say about this book. So media theorist and author Douglas Rushkoff says John Dee is the original Elizabethan mage scientist who invented the British Empire and invested it with magical power. He is to Elizabeth what Merlin was to Arthur, except he was real. Here's the original technology of weaponized memes, psyops, and empire building in a gripping, authoritative account of how and why we became an occult society. Penn award-winning author and also guest on this podcast, Mitch Horowitz, says, any biographical treatment of John Dee must be nothing less than epic. And Jason Louv has gloriously achieved this in John Dee and the Empire of Angels, a truly comprehensive, broad-spectrum, and lavishly beautiful historical study of the Master Magus and the countercurrent of secret history Dee launched into the world, which has affected us all. Everyone's favorite psychedelic comedian and podcaster Duncan Trussell says a crazy plunge into the weird world of angels and those brave or foolish enough to try to contact them. Be prepared for this book illuminates the dark corners of history that many institutions would prefer to go unexplored and unmentioned. I'm thankful for the angels that aided Jason in his creation of this mind spinning glorious work of occult genius. And finally, preeminent occult author Lon Mai Ludiquette says Jason Liu's work succeeds with breathtaking thoroughness to tell this amazing and true magical tale. More importantly, he also reveals the profound geopolitical significance of Dee's magical explorations, effects that still shape the global realities of today. Okay, so the full book is waiting for you at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble or just go to JohnD007.com. That's the numbers 007, so JohnD007.com because he was, of course... The original 007, that's where Ian Fleming got that for James Bond. And all the links you need to get the book are right there. So search John D. and the Empire of Angels at Amazon.com or go to Barnes & Noble or go to John D. 007.com. It's all there. I can't wait for you to read the book. And until next time, lots of love. I honor you and stay awake.